Thanks, everyone. Uh, so yeah, my name is Steve Tegler. I'm a director of systems engineering at uh, VMware. I actually live in the Seattle area, so it's kind of kind of nice to come down here. Uh, a little change of pace here. No gray skies. I like that. Uh, to my right is Nathan Ness. He's one of the SEs uh, at VMware that supports anything related to OpenStack, basically. And we're sitting up at the booth upstairs if you want to uh, come by and talk about anything. Um, just a quick question for the audience, and it's really, you kind of fall into two buckets here. And so just uh, help me out and participate in at least one of these. How many uh, do infrastructure as code today in their environments? About half. And how many are here just because they've heard it and they don't really understand what it means and you just want to learn a little more? All right, a little bit more. All right, good. So for the folks on the left who do it today, um, probably the only thing you're going to get out of this session is really uh, understanding maybe how you can communicate these concepts to other folks in your organization because you know it's a great thing to do, but you're not quite sure how to sell it internally, so to speak. Um, but for the most part, the presentation is really focused on folks that um, are infrastructure background and what uh, infrastructure as code means to them and their jobs and, and uh, IT. So um, who am I? So I'm a director of pre-sales engineering. So anything OpenStack VMware related, uh, myself and my team uh, covered at VMware, vSphere, NSX, uh, VMware integrated OpenStack, uh, our distribution. I have an infrastructure background, okay? I am not a coder, okay? So I started off working on HPUX back in 1997, right, for, for HP. I did a little pivot from that and worked on storage, fiber channel switching, moved to Cisco, uh, did some networking, and in turn got into server virtualization. So every time I've kind of changed careers, I picked a, a technology area that's just kind of tangent to what I've been doing. And so after server virtualization at, at, at Cisco, I ended up uh, going to a company called NYSERA, which maybe you've heard of that um, uh, obviously big contributors uh, to Neutron, um, but also a network virtualization uh, company. And so the question is, what, what's the next pivot here at this point? Everything's kind of been tangent. And it really is about the cloud management platform. So at NYSERA, I realized fairly early on that we had this amazing technology, but if you didn't have a method to consume the technology, we weren't going to get very far. So I quickly realized there has to be this cloud management platform or infrastructure as a service or something to be able to consume these network features that we were offering with our product. Okay. So I started to really look at you know, what makes up a cloud management platform, what is the impact of the business, certainly OpenStack, this was back in what, 2012, late 2011, um, had a lot to do with it. And I actually ended up watching one YouTube video as I was doing research where light bulbs started going off. And it was this YouTube video here from the 2009 Velocity Conference, if you've ever heard of that, um, Infrastructure in the Cloud Era. And so this guy on the left is Adam Jacob. He, Jacob he's the CTO of, of Chef. And you, know, you only need to watch about 30 minutes. Um, and it just gives great perspective on different ways to control infrastructure and do it manually versus automated. The plus and minus is really good, so I'd highly recommend uh, taking a look at that. But what's really interesting to me is that the date is 2009. That's seven years ago. And we're still struggling from an enterprise perspective how to do some of these basic concepts. Okay. So um, I learned that, so I quickly realized that, boy, I'm an infrastructure person, and if I don't learn coding, I'm going to become irrelevant. So I need to stay one step ahead of the curve. So I needed to start learning these principles, and honestly, that scared, the, that scared me, because I don't know anything about coding, right? How am I going to learn this? There's the, the software developers in a whole different world. So, um, so I did that, so, so I need to learn these coding principles in order to understand the consumption. So if, if I want to see OpenStack successful in my business, I need to make sure that the developers know how to consume it, and I need to understand how the consumption happens, okay? So again, I got to pivot. I got to go a little more tangent here. And so, I, you know, now I look at OpenStack. I personally believe the success of OpenStack is tied um, uh, to the ability to actually consume it and sell it internally. Uh, software developers, they like to, you know, there's public clouds that are available that they know how to use you know, try and tell them, okay, stop using that public cloud here. I just built up an OpenStack cloud for you. Start using it. And you really got to be able to understand their world to understand how to sell what you've created, basically, which is an OpenStack cloud. Common definition of infrastructure as code, again, from this uh, guy, Adam Jacob, enable the reconstruction of the business from nothing but a source code repository, uh, a data backup of your application, and bare metal. That's like utopia, okay? 
So theoretically, I can have my compute network storage security services here. I grab my data, which is the state of my application, okay? And I basically uh, run all this code to go recreate that application and tie it to the state of the application, which is the data, okay? So this is certainly utopia. Can any business just, you know, shut down a data center and move it? You know, I'm sure there's maybe one or two, but um, it's, it's a challenge, it's hard. So what we need to look at is like infrastructure provisioning. That's where we need to start. So we need to understand the, con the context of where the infrastructure pr uh, provisioning happens. And this is a highly generic view of uh, uh, continuous integration uh, pipeline here. But what I want to do is articulate when the, the provisioning and the deployment happens. So here you've got a developer, they've got source code management, they're doing commits and, and, and check-ins here. Um, they pass that, once they commit it, they pass it to the build or the CI pipeline. So I, I consider these kind of the engines of the whole process, things like Jenkins and TeamCity, okay? Uh, as a part of that, they do, go run through some testing frameworks and then when they're done, they build binaries and stick, it, uh, you know, stick their software artifact um, uh, in a repository. So basically, you know, the, the developer can do a lot of this potentially on their own, on their laptop, in a very small environment, but eventually they're going to need real infrastructure to actually run this on. And so that's this piece right here. So eventually they go and they do uh, the provisioning and the deployment. So what does that look like? Is that manual or is that automated today? So let's look at that. Here's the consumer. The application developer, they have their tool bag of tools that they use today to actually uh, deploy their application. And so today, oh, and, and our ops team, so compute network storage. So today what typically happens if this is manual, the developer goes to some web portal, probably internally, or sends an email that says, I need a specific number of VMs, I need some security associated to it because it's a web application, um, I, I'm going to need some storage and so forth. So they basically fill out this form and they hit submit, and that form ends up going down to the operations teams, okay? You then have a human being looking at something, okay? And whenever you get a human being looking at something and potentially interpreting something, you, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult sometimes, let's just say that. So, so in effect, they look at, at the request and you know, they're gonna make some interpretations, and then what they do is they go pound away on their keyboards. And this is probably three different people. Maybe this happens serially, like it's got to go to the compute, and then it goes to the networking, and then we've got to apply security. You know, it's totally variable no matter what, uh, you know, IT department you're looking at. But they're pounding away. And meanwhile, uh, the, the app devs are waiting. Eventually, they finish up. They actually deploy the uh, infrastructure pieces. So this is, you know, usually a, a VM image or an instance image. You got some networks, some routing, that sort, sort of thing. And then once that's up, they take the unique data about that environment and these guys end up sending it up here and they have to look at that environment as well. They gotta look at the IP address of where they log in and where they need to provision the app. So they need to take that information and stick it into their tools to go actually provision the actual application, okay? So there's two main highlights in this. There are two manual steps that occur, right? Which is the ops team interpreting what the request is and then back here, there's potentially a manual step of that developer looking at the information they got back. So variability and time, that's the enemy here. So what's the, what's the alternative method, say with a, a public or a private cloud? So typically there is a, a cloud API, which allows you to provision infrastructure. So in this case, instead of the, the developer just sending through a request with the information, I like to use the term, they have to describe the infrastructure in a very specific way, okay? So they literally go up here and uh, I've got my specific form here. So my web instance, there's the name, there's the flavor, this is the exact image I want to use as a part of this. Uh, maybe down lower in this description, you've got the specifics around the actual network IP address range or some security and so forth. So, um, you know, and this varies no matter, you know, whatever kind of cloud you have, the formatting. I mean, this is, uh, I call this uh, Steve's, uh, Steve's language here. It means nothing. I think I made it up. So, um, but in effect, you describe it in a very specific way, and that's the key. Okay, so it's fundamentally the same information, but described away. So these folks need to know how to do this. Once they've described it in its entirety, they pass it to the cloud API, 
And the cloud API automatically provisions that same topology that we used to do manually, if they've done it right. If they haven't done it right, guess what? They get to go fix their code, so to speak, and they get to do it again until it, they get it right. But they're in complete control over the success of whether that's deployed correctly or not. So you spin that up, it's, it, so first of all, it's fast, but more importantly, it's predictable and it's automated. So this is a part, remember the whole flow of the life cycle of the app, instead of stopping and opening a ticket, I just keep using those same tools to provision the infrastructure instead of stopping and waiting. Additionally, what was that other manual step? Like the uniqueness of this environment that gets provisioned, we gotta get some data out of there. Well, guess what? That can all be automated as well. You dig out the information, the cloud responds with um, the specifics around that, and it goes back into the flow and things just go and then you deploy the, the app. Okay, so you eliminate two manual steps from a traditional sense, which gives you great efficiency here. Okay, so why is co code so great for infrastructure? You know, um, certainly I can build these topology templates. So I have a very, sp I have a specific application, I build this one template, and uh, I can rest assured I can reuse that where, wherever I want. It's, f it's fast, but more importantly, it's consistent, right? It's the same deployment every time. There's no variability, which is key. So I said reusable, um, you can take bits of, co obviously bits of code, if, if it's a way to describe it, you just cut and paste that into your, in your next version. Um, it, maybe, maybe it's a different application. The other thing I like to talk about is this is, it's easy to test permutation of, permutations of hardware. So if I wanted to uh, test a scale up versus scale out, like maybe one vCPU versus eight, it's very easy for me to go into that file and instead of specify a small VM, I can specify a large one. I mean, it's, it's very simple and then I hit submit and it goes and runs the test, presuming you have a, a test suite that can test performance, okay? So it's very easy to do uh, iterations. You know, do, maybe one of my flavors is SSD and the other SATA. I can actually figure out what the impact is of a different disk without having to actually ask the infrastructure team to go do something different, okay? By far the most important thing though, when things break, I actually can troubleshoot them easy because I have this thing called version control, which I'll talk about in, in just a second. But I basically see, and it's documented, all of the infrastructure changes over time if I'm doing it right. Okay, so application anatomy. So what are the various, what, are the, what is the various code that's used to make up uh, the application? So, um, you know, this is more, this is a gross generalization of, uh, of the code uh, which makes up an app, but in effect we've got our infrastructure code, that's now a part of the application, that's inherent in it. You've got the configuration code that basically says, after I spin up some um, uh, instances uh, that are basically maybe a gold image, I can go then and patch it to wherever I need to, but basically get it ready until the actual application gets deployed. So I like to think of these three buckets here. And notice on, on the screen, I've got a bunch of different files underneath. So there's lots of different tools. There's, total, there's, there's just 100 different ways to actually, um, you know, deploy this different, or leverage this different kind of code depending on what tools the developers are using today. So use cases. So let's talk about um, one use case here, which is disaster recovery. So that has to do with that other slide I said where you can reconstruct the entire business. So what would that look like? What would that process look like? So on the left-hand side here, we see um, uh, you know, our infrastructure site number one running OpenStack. Uh, I've got my um, uh, applications already deployed. My data is being replicated to another site. And that other site also has uh, OpenStack um, installed uh, there. But nothing, none of the, nothing's running over there per se. You can see at the top of the screen, I've got the source code uh, repository. That's all the code. That's the infrastructure code, um, configuration, and uh, app code, okay? And, you know, in a previous job when I was working, the VP of IT used to say, um, if you ever want to, or to ensure um, the, the uptime of your data center, never let an electrician do maintenance, right? So there are numerous examples of the industry of, uh, of electricians and doing other. So I went with that example here. So here's the electrician. They switch A instead of B from a UPS perspective. They blow up the UPS data centers down. Okay. So now I got nothing. I got nothing but my source code repository and my data. So the one thing I need to start with, I need that deployment pipeline. I need those tools in place to basically run that, I call it a run book of getting those applications up. 
And so the first thing I do is I run infrastructure as code as a part of that. So it goes down, it lays down the networks, the IP addresses, the, um, the gold images of the VMs. Then I run the configuration code and it actually will do the patching or whatever other configuration that needs to be done to those gold images to get them ready for, of course, the actual application code. And then that gets connected to your data. So again, this is, this is utopia, right? This is not something that's easy to do, but if you can do it, Think of, the, I mean, think of the, the possibilities in terms of where you could put your app and how easy it would be to move your app from one location to another. Okay. So what about ongoing operations benefits? So that's like day zero. Um, arguably, any, if you're doing this correctly, it should always be considered day zero because you're always starting from nothing and you're building up the infrastructure and everything. But ongoing, what are some of the use cases here? So the first thing you need to take into consideration um, is another um, a techn a technology area called version control. And I'll read the definition. So it's a system that records changes to a file or a set of files over time. So you can go back and look at versions over time. Okay? So there's my application. I've got a lot of different files. You know, infrastructure code isn't just one file. Configuration code isn't just one file, right? They could be spread across different tools and so forth. But it's the collection of all of this. And so the main benefit of this is that you have complete visibility in any change. I mean, think about software developers. What do they do? They're constantly changing. They need to roll back. They need to figure out what's going Same thing applies here uh, when we're talking about infrastructure code. OK. So let's take, for example, I am doing some code development on an application and then you know, February, March, April, May. And then all of a sudden, between April and May, I run a security audit or a security test on the application. Okay? And it fails. Okay, it fails over here. If I'm doing infrastructure as code, I have an exact record of what changed at that point in time. So I go to my source code repository or version control, and all I have to do is look at the different configuration between those two days where it passed and it didn't pass. And you can see here I have an example. of They enabled TCP port 22 here, so that failed. Okay? So it's very, very basic. You do a diff, I mean, these are pretty simple concepts, but when you start applying them to infrastructure, it can be pretty powerful. So a few other use cases here. Um, you know, you could use this to potentially test firewall changes. So you can, um, you know, if you've, if you've got uh, firewall functionality security groups, you can go in and you can make those changes and see what the impact of the application is. Is the application relying on other ports outside of, uh, of what I've configured? Um, Test if your application is IP address dependent. But no, but wait a minute, nobody uh, uses hard-coded IPs anymore, right? Um, 192, 168, whatever, you can go ahead and change that in code. You can change the network inside uh, the uh, configuration to a different IP address range, and you can actually see if that affects the application in any way. Um, again, I, I talked about testing different uh, permutations. So if you wanted to go test uh, different hardware or uh, physical characteristics of the virtual machine to see how it affect the performance of the app, that's one thing. Again, the most important thing here, I think, the, most, the biggest value add is the rollback functionality. If something goes haywire, you have an accurate record of what's changed over time, and you can always roll back to the way it was before. And that's really powerful. If you think about the way infrastructure changes occur, the, typically in a manual process, it's someone going in, editing some settings, and you're lucky if that shows up in syslog. Right? OK, so getting started. What's, how, do I, how do I get started on this? So first of all, um, you know, IT, we got a problem. I, you know, I think everyone will agree that the social aspects of change and new technology are far more difficult than um, the actual technology itself. So first of all, what you need, you've got your developers and your infrastructure team, you basically got to build a bridge between them. You have to find someone on the infrastructure team that is interested in learning about coding or some of these principles and are not afraid of it. And then you need a, a developer, potentially, that wants to understand a little bit more about infrastructure so they can make more intelligent decisions on how to architect their app. Okay? So it's a little bit of both. They're both going to have to learn a little bit. So infrastructure teams, software development practices, they're going to learn things like version control. And again, I was an infrastructure person, and it was scary to me, but I mean, it was literally like a couple hour conversation with, with, a, with a software developer, oh, I get it. And then the light bulb went on, and I started thinking about all these things you could, you could potentially do. So devs, they're going to need to understand infrastructure. Um, so they're going to they, need to know the proper way to deploy the infrastructure. 
And when I say devs, it's actually kind of an interesting thing, because so am I talking about the actual software developer, or is maybe there a new classification of someone called an infrastructure developer that exists, right? So it could, it, you know, it could be, and it's totally dependent on how big your organization is and your silos and all sorts of things. Um, but the important thing is there's someone that understands these principles and they can start applying them to, to infrastructure. All right, it's uh, demo time. So Nathan's gonna run through a demo here in just a second. I'll give you uh, an idea of what this is gonna look like. So we have uh, an application here, so it's called Go Reminder, and we've got the various code. And in our case, we're really only using two tools here, Heat and Chef, so Heat is responsible for not only infrastructure code, but we're using CloudNet inside OpenStack. Um, and that is responsible for some of the configuration, namely installing Chef. Chef gets spun up, it runs through additional configuration that deploys the app. So our situation here is we've got Go Reminders version 34, okay? And that is the collection of all this code here. And what we're doing is we're doing an external security test. Um, we're just using Nmap, pretty straightforward, right, to check to see if ports are open. And right now we're using the standardized port that our business doesn't allow, the 8080, and we got 22 enabled, kind of like that previous slide. And so what we want to do is we need to go in, and not only do we have to make changes to the firewall functionality inside uh, OpenStack, but also uh, we need to make changes to Chef um, to allow for the new ports. Okay, so theoretically we run the test, then uh, we pass because uh, we're now configured for 8081. So that is the demo. And I'll let Nathan walk you through what that looks like. All right. So here we can see, uh, like Steve said, we're going to run uh, Nmap on that application. You can see that 8080 are open for the application, and then port 22 is open as well. So that's something we're going to change in version control. So I'm going to go to my developer workstation where I've cloned that Git repository where all of this is being version controlled. So the first thing I'll do is change the heat template, and this is going to change, make the change to the infrastructure, right? So I'll reflect a new port from a security perspective. And then I'm going to lock down port 22 to a very specific IP address instead of allowing anyone to be able to SSH to this web server, right? And so I'll make this change in heat, which is going to make the change from an infrastructure perspective. And now I'm going to actually make the change to the configuration code because I have attributes. I've abstracted all of these attributes to the application uh, with Chef. It's not to say that you couldn't use Puppet or anything else. In, in this particular case, we're just using Chef as an example. So I'm going to modify the, uh, the attributes file for the Chef Cookbook, and I'm going to change the Go Reminders port to 8081 instead of 8080. Okay. Once I've saved these files, I can actually do a git diff, and it's going to show me all of the changes that I've made underneath version control. Right? So you can see this, and this is as a developer, I'm looking to say, all right, these are the appropriate changes that I want, and if I'm happy with that of what I've done locally on my workstation here, then I can go ahead and review them, say, yep, this is good to go, and I'm going to commit that change into Garrett. Right? And so when I say commit, I'm just going to type a little message that says what I've done, uh, update the application port and the security settings, and then I'm going to, uh, as soon as I submit that, I'm going to submit that for review. Okay, so I'm going to say git review on my workstation, and that is going to kick off a Jenkins job that's going to actually take the code that was submitted from Garrett and Git and run the compile on the job. So the first job is to build Go Reminders application. Basically take the changes that I've done from uh, Chef and the infrastructure template, run the tests on them. If that test passes, then I'm actually going to kick off a new job uh, called de Deploy Go Reminders, and that's when my infrastructure test is actually going to happen. So the first one is to do the compile. The next one you can see here will be Deploy Go Reminders, so that job just kicked off and it will actually kick off a heat template to reflect those new changes, right? So it's gonna run that heat stack that I just modified, and then I can actually go ahead and test my changes. So I'll go into OpenStack here, uh, click the refresh button, you should see, you can see that I'm, uh, Go Reminders 91 was the previous build that I was testing, that you could see that 8080 and 22 were open, and then you can see that Go Reminders 91 is my new build that I just kicked off, right? <clears throat> So here I'm going to get the new IP. It's going to kick the job off, and now it's going to kick this instance off. 
Um, now I'm actually going to test this build and say, all right, are my uh, changes successful on top of the infrastructure? Right, and so I can go back, and, and right now, this is, uh, Chef is running, so it's giving its, uh, its DNA to this particular application, right? So it takes a little bit for Chef to run, that's why I'm not running Nmap immediately, because it's getting at its identity from Chef and getting that new port number uh, pulled down, right? So it just gives it a second here, and then we'll run Nmap here in a second, and let's test our changes that we've made with the, with the infrastructure. I'll kick it off here in a second. Yeah. No. All right, so there we go. So now it's going to kick off the new IP. I'm going to test the new IP, the new build. And you can see there where I just have now, I just have 8081 instead of 8080 and I'm locking out port 22. So all of the infrastructure changes have been reflected. Uh, it tests good. Now I can go back into Garrett and actually commit that change back into the master repository, right? Because I'm happy with the infrastructure change, the build compiled, uh, and so now I can commit that into master, and I have a record of what change occurred, what I did, and I can go back into Garrett and see the diff of that, uh, and you know, basically provide accountability for all of these infrastructure changes. Thank you. Thank you.